start recording. Okay. I think, as Rio said, donde esta la presentacion? But it's here now. That's what matters. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lecture 9. Um, we are here today. We're going to be covering some last topics. And so um, let's have fun with this lecture. So um, this one is going to be kind of a review. So um, I suspect you guys are going to know this stuff already. But yeah, today we're going to be talking about phase arrays, um, active electronically steerable microwave phase arrays. Um, I hope you guys did the assignment over the weekend. Um, we're going to review some stuff. So just as a quick summary of what we're going to do, we're going to look at microwave antennas, which you guys have seen before. Uh, we're going to be talking about wideband patch antenna design, which I know you guys have been, you know, looking at some like narrowband stuff, maybe a little bit broadband, but we're going to be looking at um, some more novel designs that you guys can do. Phase shifters versus TEUs, you know, for your, within your phase array. Um, Multi-element um, integration, and then uh, we'll go over some practice problems. So be fun. Any questions at all? Great, awesome. So uh, let's look at a uh, just review phase arrays. We looked at this before. This is a phase array diagram. You'll see it's consisting of multiple elements. We have a flat plane of exciters. Um, each element is independently phased, amplitude, and controlled. Um, and what happens is that you know when we have this emitter, all the elements you know they emit their own wavefronts, and they kind of coherently combine together to create a new phase center and new phase um, wavefront. And so that allows us to control um, the beam of the phase array, and um, we can do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, here's kind of an example. It's a little linear array. You see all of those are little tiny uh, microstrip antennas. So super great. Awesome. Let's look at some examples. So here we got one. Um, that's at Lincoln Laboratories. That's a little, you can see, multi-element phase array. I don't know. There's probably like 100 in there. Um, we have this one. It's a linear antenna, also from Lincoln Labs, of course. Um, this is what the the total wave pattern looks like, but you guys already knew that. And of course, one example of where we use phase arrays, this is a Patriot missile battery. So to shoot down ballistic missiles, we gotta have a, something way, some way to detect them. So we use a phase array, so really simple. Um, so any questions on this? No, 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 awesome. Okay, check your understanding. Can you guys uh, do these both problems? This one is kind of a review of last week's question, but I suspect you guys have some problems. So I'll give you some time to do that. So, Julie, what's, uh, what's your answer for, for part A right here? Required width? C. C, okay, okay. This wasn't multiple choice. But anyways, <laughs> let's get back into the real lecture, which is signal integrity. Um, we're looking at some advanced PCB design techniques. I guess, you know, if you could apply some of these to phased arrays, but um, maybe in a couple years you guys can, can do some phased array stuff. But yeah, some of this is going to be review. Um, of what we kind of covered in lecture three and other lectures, but we're really going to dive into signal integrity. And I have some really cool simulations and visualizations so you guys can really understand um, what's up when it comes to designing for signals, really high frequency stuff. So first we're going to start off with high frequency signals. And what are high frequency signals? Well, they're simply um, semi-periodic waveforms that kind of represent signals in like measurements. Um, those can include things like analog sensor outputs, um, digital communications, radio signals, and like the output of an on and off switch. So any kind of like changing voltage or changing current that we use to measure or indicate something, that's a signal. And you can see it's here are some examples. We have our um, digital waveform, you know, ones and zeros. We also have like an analog waveform. This might come out of like a light sensor or something. And so the great thing about these uh, high frequency signals is for simplicity, we can kind of represent them all as simple sinusoidal waveforms. So just like this, you guys have seen this before, you know, in all your math and stuff, it's just a simple sinusoid. And the key thing about this is that it has, you know, um, some sort of amplitude, um, a wavelength slash frequency slash period, you know, just how many times it repeats, and um, as well as a, a phase, which isn't really shown here, but like a phase, if we were to measure this signal relative to another signal. And of course, Fourier decomposition allows us to do this, but it doesn't really matter all too much. Um, but so when we refer to a signal, uh, we're just gonna kind of think of it as a sine wave of some frequency, some amplitude, and some phase, essentially. And so um, what happens is that the reason why we're talking about this is because um, as signals get faster and faster within our PCBs, um, they can kind of start to act up a little bit, you know, um, devices that use these high frequency signals, 
um, they can become more sensitive as you know communication speeds and frequencies increase within our signals and um, that's kind of due to the fact that as the frequency of like a waveform increases its wavelength decreases and so when the wavelength of this signal decreases to near the size of our devices um, that's when the wave solutions to Maxwell's equations can start applying. So what that sort of means is that we start to get things like wave propagation and weird coupling effects that, that start to happen when um, our like physical, you know, like electronic, like, you know, wave starts getting close to like the length of our wires. And so that's really not a good thing. And we can get all sorts of issues from that. Um, we also um, start to be more affected by the parasitic elements within our, our PCBs. So like that's like our like um, equivalent series resistance and all of that. Um, our high frequency signals are going to be much more sensitive to those parasitic elements. So um, that means that devices are going to start acting more non-ideal. You know, a resistor is no longer going to act really like a pure resistor, same thing with an inductor and capacitor. So we'll need to take that into account. Um, and so you can kind of see that um, which is in here. Um, for those who've taken 6200, you know, you guys remember um, like the impedance relationships and you'll see that impedance <coughs> is going to start to really matter because impedance is kind of frequency driven. Um, you see like in the impedance equations over here, you see for a capacitor and inductor, it kind of is um, dependent on the frequency, this is frequency omega. And so the impedance of the circuit is going to start to really matter with these high frequency signal, high frequency signals. Um, and we're going to have to start to design traces and devices to um, match a particular characteristic impedance in order to match the impedance throughout the entire board. So essentially, we got to start worrying about more things, which is not great. And uh, why is this so important? Well, you know, when we, when we get high frequency signals, um, any sort of discontinuity in impedance is actually going to cause all sorts of weird effects. So you see here, this is like one example. We have a device. It doesn't matter what this device is, but this device spits out like a high frequency signal. This, is a, this device receives the high frequency signal. And you see that this device has an output impedance of 25 ohms. And so what happens is that as the signal comes out and it hits the, in this case, this is just a wire or transmission line. As it hits that, um, there's a large impedance gradient, you know, just a sudden change in impedance. And it's the same thing over here when we go 50 ohms to high impedance, which probably means like a million ohms or something like that. Um, you'll see that the output results in this. So the green line, which you can kind of see, you know, that's our pure sine wave that comes out of the device. Then when um, it comes out of the device and hits the, hits the transmission line, it, as Winnie, you know, talked about in a previous lecture, it starts to reflect and it also starts to get all these weird characteristics. You can kind of see that by that blue line, we have this weird ringing effect um, and the signal gets distorted. And so, after it goes to the transmission line, then it hits the receiver and it gets even more and more kind of whacked up. So it no longer looks like that pure square wave, which is what we want in order to have good kind of signaling. And so to quantify it, it can result in reflections that distort our signals. That's kind of like the weird ringing that you see. Uh, we can get degradation in the, in the signal, which reduces our device's ability to recognize what the signals is, signals are. Um, so like that's mainly like reduction in the amplitude and also like increase in the noise of our signal. And then we can also um, experience radiation of these signals from our wires and from our devices, which is not a good thing. Um, that means, you know, energy is being converted from, you know, electrons within our wires into radio waves, which is not so great. And to really kind of visualize what like these impedance discontinuities look like, um, this is like a little animation. It's like, it's, this is of a transient signal. And this line you see right in the middle, this is an impedance discontinuity. So all that matters is that this area over here is one impedance, this area over here is a different impedance. And you see that as the signal crosses through that um, discontinuity, it retains its shape and it retains its motion. So like it still passes through just fine, but you'll see that it gets reduced in amplitude. That's number one. And we also see a reflection that recurs. So that reflection is now going back to the device. So like if it came out of here, it'd go all the way here and then reflect back. And that kind of, that can like reflect back and forth, back and forth, which is not good. Um, leads to standing waves and all that. So we don't want this to happen essentially. We want this wave to pass through um, as if there was nothing there, no reflections, no degradation. And so the way we do that is of course by 
ensuring that we have a proper same impedance over everything. So typically that's like in devices, the standard is 50 ohms. So we want everything to be 50 ohms generally. Um, as long as it's the same impedance, it's all good. And so some of the things that could happen when we, we have impedance mismatches is um, we get, of course, that degradation and interference. Um, and, you know, it's going to inhibit our PCB's ability to function properly. So if I have a radio and, you know, we have a lot of impedance mismatches and all my signals are reflecting and getting attenuated and all of that, you know, I don't think my radio is going to work so well. You know, just like why, you know, sometimes when you listen to a really old radio, it's really crackly and all that. We don't want that. We want it to work super good. And the same thing can happen with digital devices as well. Um, as signals get de degraded more and more, you know, our um, digital devices are unable to really communicate with each other. So it's not a good thing. Um, and uh, when it comes to the radiation problem, well, we don't want it to radiate because that's going to interfere with other devices on our board or maybe other boards. And um, generally, this is not a good thing. In fact, uh, the FCC, whenever you make a, a new board or any kind of like design, they have regulations that state, you know, you can't go out emitting just random things. You know, I can't create like a, you know, I can't let my phone be like a jammer to other phones. That's not a good thing. So um, a lot of times, you know, there are, there are regulations and emission requirements that you have to meet. So um, it's important to, to ensure that you, you design well for signal integrity, design for high frequency stuff. And as a fun fact, in fact, for RF um, emissions testing, where you have to test whether or not you're emitting anything, you actually take your devices to an anechoic chamber, but not for sound, for uh, RF. And it's just like a normal anechoic chamber, except this stuff is impregnated with like iron and steel and all that. So it actually absorbs radio waves. So like this, this whole chamber like is radio wave free. Um, yeah. So if you want to escape the, the 5G microchip, you know, COVID inducing signals, you know, go there. The government doesn't want to say that. I'm just saying. Anyways, even though I work for the government, um, how do we design for signal integrity? Well, this is a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, let's look at, you know, what we got to consider. And there's a lot of things that we have to consider when we, when we talk about high frequency PCB design. Um, just some of them, impedance matching, radiation loss, coupling, degradation, material selection, shielding, flexions, power, rounding, size, parasitic, skin effect, connectors, sensitivity. And there's a whole bunch of things that we have to take into account. And uh, in fact, we're going to cover all of these things today. Just kidding. We're not going to cover all of those. That's a lot of things. We're just going to cover these main, main things, um, which, you know, they kind of really matter. And um, they're things that we can really control when it comes to uh, our PCB designs. Um, and so, yeah, but before I go any further, any questions so far on anything I've covered? That includes phase arrays, if you want to ask a question about them. Cool. So, um, now you may ask, well, how are we going to, like, think about this? Because, like, you've been spewing out words, you've shown a couple animations, you know, like, how are we going to think about these high-frequency signals? And so that's kind of a difficult thing. It's kind of like, wishy-washy like you know i'm telling you like hey this is a high frequency signal and if you do this it's going to be bad um, but luckily we have technology at our hands and so uh, we can actually use some simulation softwares in this case i'm using ANSYS hfss it's just like a high frequency some finite element solver so it allows us to kind of like literally simulate out all of the um all the waves and electrons that like flow through circuits and we can uh, apply that to kind of a model of our PCB uh, in order to look like what this, in order to see what the signals will be like and how they're affected by different factors in our PCB. So we're going to start off with a microstrip model, which consists of a copper trace, dielectric, you know, some kind of non-conducting substrate, um, and a copper ground plane. And um, we'll attach ports to the end of that microstrip, so just the end of the traces. And this is kind of what it looks like. It's just, you know, literally a really simple PCB. Under here, like I said before, there's a ground plane, and then we have the trace on the top, and then this green stuff is like the PCB substrate, the non-conductive dielectric. And so you can't see it, but I have like imaginary ports that are signed here and here. So essentially, like I send out a signal through this end, it flows through here, and it gets absorbed to the other end, or vice versa. Um, and so this is what we're going to use to kind of model out um, how our high-frequency signals kind of, kind of 
you know, get interact with the PCB, the trace, the ground plane, and everything. And we can also visualize it and all of that. And so um, that's uh, what we can do. And we can use that to, of course, you know, show off what are signal degradations, coupling, radiation, and reflections. Um, and we're going to be able to visualize it out. And, um, you know, after solving it, this is actually kind of like what it looks like. So right now I have the electric fields plotted in the air around the trace. And you can see that as I put a current through this trace, this, by the way, this is a, this is a signal. So it's just a, a sine wave. In this case, it's 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, oops. Um, we have a sine wave going through here. And you can see that as it flows through here, electric fields emanate away from the trace through the air, as to be expected uh, when we, you know, when we have a signal. And you can see that um, they're clearly coming out of this end and they're flowing this way because they're, they're greater over here and they kind of dampen out as they go to this side. And so this is going to be quite useful to kind of see, you know, how, how these signals work. So um, I guess now that we have this model, let's take a look at how um, they kind of flow through the trace. So you can see here, um, these are the currents that are flowing here. Really, it's the electric field I'm plotting, but electric fields and currents, you know, they're basically just directly proportional um, when we're talking about signals in steady state. And so you can see the electric fields, you know, it's like a wave. So it's kind of like a wave-like motion as it goes from up here all the way down here. Um, and so now that we, we have a model for this, we can see, you know, kind of how does the signal get affected as, we, as it flows through this microstrip. And so we can actually plot that out. This is um, the signal loss that we experience uh, measured relative to frequency. And we can see that, you know, as we, um, as we put our signal through here and as we increase the frequency of the signal, we start to get the effects that I kind of mentioned before. So the signal, you know, its wavelength gets closer and closer to the length of this microstrip. So we start getting radiation effects, we start getting distortions. And so you'll see that as in frequency increases, we get greater and greater loss. Um, zero dB up here, this is, um, our signals at zero dB basically means that when it flows from this port to this port, it experiences zero loss at all. And then as it goes, as you go down this y-axis into, this is the dB scale, by the way, as you go down the y-axis, um, lower numbers mean greater loss, which is not good in our case. And so uh, you kind of see that, you know, more frequency means more loss. And um, 3 dB basically means like we've lost half of the amount of power that we put in. So you'll notice like, yeah, the power that we put in here, half of it is lost. Uh, like at like, you know, 2.6 gigahertz going from this end of the microstrip to this end of the microstrip, which is really not good. That's like awful. Um, and so this is really why we have to kind of think a lot about um, high frequency design because we can lose a lot of power. And um, this is not even showing like the reflections and kind of the dis noise distortions that we get as we put the signal in. This is just showing you the degradation of power. And so uh, this is really important stuff. Now, um, saying this, where do you guys think your projects generally align within this graph in terms of the amount of loss they're going to be experiencing? Does anybody have a guess? You'd like to guess? Well, if you guess that they experience very little loss, you are very, very right. You guys, these projects are like right down over here. So you'll see that like you're basically right at zero dB. So you're not experiencing any kind of like signal degradations or anything like that. Even for like NOAA's like radio, no losses really much. But it's still good practice to really think about, you know, how can we design for signal integrity? And this also doesn't take into account like radiation and stuff like that. But generally for, for low frequency items, you're not gonna experience too much of, of what we described today. But if you start working on something like Wi-Fi, for example, that's like all the way down here. You see that's in that like 3 dB area. You know, we're, we're losing half the power that we put in. So that's really not a good thing. So when you start designing for high frequency devices, so Wi-Fi, you know, radios, microwave things, um, this is, becomes very, very important. And so the number one thing we can do, of course, when, when we um, design our traces is uh, we can impedance match. And that's like the number one thing to, to kind of ensure that we reduce losses and reduce all of this kind of funky stuff that happens to our um, signals. And so the main way we do that with a microstrip is um, we actually can adjust the width of the microstrip. And that kind of allows us to adjust the impedance. There are other factors too. Um, and so you see that. Um, and so 
we can adjust the, the impedance by changing the trace width. And so in this case, I have the ports, they're all terminated at 50 ohms. So I want this microstrip to therefore be 50 ohms in order to, in order to match the impedance and result in the lowest amount of loss. And so, but there, you know, there are other factors that in change, you know, how the microstrip, um, what its impedance is. It's, it's not only trace width, but also the trace thickness, dielectric height, and dielectric constant. Dielectric constant basically being a measure of how non-conductive a, a material is. Because inherently, you know, if you look at the broad picture, all materials are conductive and non-conductive, but um, some more than others. And so this is like a measure of kind of how conductive something is, kind of. Um, but uh, within our PCBs, the only thing we're really able to change is just the trace width. We can't really change the trace thickness. That's like our manufacturer says that. Same thing with the dielectric height. Um, you can't really change that. And same thing with the dielectric constant. It's, you can change these things, but they're expensive to do. But when it comes to like our microstrip and a lot of other traces, we can really only change the trace width. And so um, when we do that for our microstrip that we showed before to decrease its loss, yeah, Lee? Can't you technically change the dielectric height by changing the PCB stacker? Yeah, but like, um, that, that's true. But uh, like when you're trying to match like a certain impedance, like if I kept my trace width like constant and I try changing my stack up, there's, you know, there's like only like a certain number of stack ups that you can have. So um, generally it's just... from like two to four changes the stack. Yes, yeah, the, the, stack, the stack up, the thickness, of um, your dielectric will we'll change the impedance a lot. Yeah, but that's a good, that's a good point. Um, the trace width, adjusting it allows us to get the together because you can make the trace width as big or small as you want, generally, or it's like as variably big or small, uh, which you can't really get with these, even though you could like pay a manufacturer to, to do something like this, not great. But anyways, changing the trace width, um, we'll see we result in different um, levels of loss. And so this corresponds directly with the impedance of our um, trace. So you see that we start off, the trace that I showed before, it was 0.5 millimeters wide. As you can see, as I, increases, as I increase the width of the trace, um, the impedance actually lowers because the, the trace has, has like a really large impedance above 50 ohms. So as I increase the width of the trace, you'll see that um, the amount of loss that we get lowers and that's because the impedance is getting the impedance of the trace is getting closer to that of the ports, so it's getting closer and closer to 50 ohms. And so, um, if I kept doing this, or if I changed these parameters too, eventually I would get a well-matched microstrip that would actually just be a line up here, right at zero dB, and that would be like a perfect, perfect, perfect transmission line. Um, obviously, I didn't do that here because I just wanted to show you know kind of what it looks like here. But generally, you know. These, these microstrips will, will have like a really good impedance match up in this region right over here. So that kind of shows you your impedance. But um, impedance matching is not on, the, the only thing that kind of affects our circuits and signals. Um, you know, that's kind of like the impedance matching, you know, it's kind of like a property of waves. But since these are electric waves, electric and magnetic waves, we also get this weird phenomenon called coupling. Um, where essentially, you know, waves from emitted by one trace can um, transmit to another trace and cause weird issues. So that brings the question, what if we put another trace in parallel with a trace I already had? So two microstrips next to each other, just like that. What happens? Well, as I said, we're going to start getting weird stuff. And um, the weird stuff happens in this coupling. So you can see how in this trace right here, I'm only exciting this trace on the left over here. Only this trace is getting a signal. Nothing, no signal is being put through the right trace. And you'll see that as I put a signal through here, it starts here and it goes down. You'll see that it emits this electric field, which reaches the other trace and induces an electric field in that other trace. You see right here, you see how it's like different shades of blue. So you'll see that, well, um, our traces are like talking to each other now. We have a copy of a, so the signal here and this trace, even though they're electrically isolated to each other. And that's because of kind of the, the coupling properties that we get um, in our signals or that occur from our high frequency signals. 
And so this could be a really big issue, especially for really sensitive systems, um, because uh, as the frequency increases, this coupling effect gets worse and worse and worse. Um, yeah, you can kind of say that's kind of interesting. And so, uh, of course, we can simulate this out. So in here, I just have, I'm showing you the electric fields inside of, of this trace. And you can see that as it flows through here, a identical copy is um, induced over here. And it has like a, a slightly, it's, it's delayed a little bit, but it's essentially, you know, if I had a sine wave in here, I would now have a sine wave in here, which is really not great. And if we plot this out, we see that this is the coupling factor. Um, I don't know if this is a real unit. It's a unit I inve invented. Um, coupling factor basically is like the level by which these two traces couple to each other. So um, lower units in this dB scale means less coupling. So if we had, you know, negative a million dB of coupling factor, that means there's zero coupling at all. And, you know, the signal get flows through here does not get coupled up here. And then if we have a higher one, um, that means more gets coupled. So zero dB of coupling factor would mean that the same amount of power that goes in here gets coupled into here, which is technically kind of impossible. Yes. Um, but anyways, you'll see that as we increase the frequency of our, um, of our signals going through this trace, we get a greater amount of power flowing into this trace. And so you'll see the coupling factor increases with frequency, which is uh, really not a great thing. And it's because, you know, our trace is radiating much more as we're increasing this frequency. And so we're getting more coupling, which is, which is not great. So um, you may ask you now, well, how do we mitigate this then? You know, we can't be having signals, you know, radiating, you know, um, injecting themselves into other traces. It's really not a good thing. So um, of course we can, we can uh, do this by, you know, just generally avoiding parallel signals like parallel traces being routed next to each other. So like if we have a multi-layer board, I can get one trace to go this way and another trace to go this way. And I'll reduce the coupling, of course. But sometimes we, we don't have like multi-layer boards and sometimes we don't want our traces, you know, like on different layers. You know, for your guys' boards, for example, there are two layers. So like you only have two layers to work with and um, sending your, your signals through vias and all that sometimes can also degrade it. And so, the main way that we can we can reduce the amount of coupling is we you know increase the distance between um, these traces just like this. Um, so as we decrease the distance, that means there's more um, distance that you know electromagnetic radiation has to cover before it goes from one trace to the other. And so um, this is going to be of course inverse proportionally. The, the amount of coupling will be inversely proportional to the distance, and um, we can use this to reduce the amount of coupling that we get through traces. Now, I will note a caveat. When it comes to differential signals, they actually kind of utilize this coupling between two, um, two traces. So that's why when we routed the differential traces, in order to maintain a certain impedance, we actually had to maintain a certain gap between them. And they actually you know, use this coupling in order to maintain a certain impedance. Um, but in this case, we're talking about like traces that are like totally different. They're not differential signals. We don't want them coupling to each other. And so, um, you know, for differential pairs, you want to follow whatever. But for, for signals that you don't want to couple, we can increase the distance. And you can see the kind of the effects that you get from, um, from doing so. So on the top, we have the one millimeter gap, which is what I showed before in, that, in the initial picture. And you'll see as I increase the gap, um, you know, more and more and more, we get a greater and greater um, reduction in coupling factor, which is really, really great. And so, that means that, you know, if you guys have traces that are really high frequency, so generally, like, in the graph I showed, you know, like, anything above, like, 500 megahertz, you know, it starts coupling to each other, um, you're going to want to start thinking about separating your traces more and more in order to reduce that coupling. Okay, look at that. Um, but that begs the question. You're like, well, I have, like, a really tiny bore, and, like, I can't increase the distance between these traces forever and ever. You know, so what if we're area constrained and we cannot increase the trace spacing? You know, it's like, what am I going to do now? Like, just not have these signals? But you need the signal. Well, am I glad to say I got a solution for you? 
what we can actually do is we can put a ground trace slash pour slash via fence uh, within it. So we can create another like copper separation between these two traces. And so in this case, I have a ground trace um, and it has this via fence within it. So this is actually connected to the bottom ground plane. So this trace is like, if you were to look at it on your PCB, it had the, the ground net assigned to it. And you'll see that I set this thin little trace separating these two traces between them. And then if we simulate out what the electric fields look like inside of there, you'll see that, um, oh, it's kind of hard to say, but you can see that the electric fields, they flow through this trace because I'm exciting it. And then it's kind of faint, but you can see the electric fields get induced into the ground trace over here by this little blue right here. And then you'll notice that no noticeable amount makes it to this trace at all. That's really cool, that's awesome. So essentially now we're kind of shielding our traces from each other using this ground plane. And it's because, you know, like the ground plane is kind of, it's more attractive, you know, for these electric fields to go to. And also like it's physically like in between these two traces. And so um, we could see that, you know, the radiated fields coupled to there. And um, the result is if we take a look, you know, as a comparison, you know, this is the trace with no shielding at all. So just like the two millimeter gap between our two coupled um, traces. And then if we, once we introduce that ground slash via shielding, you'll see that we actually get a 20 dB improvement from, from here to here, just by introducing that ground plane, introducing all those, those via fences. And so 20 dB is essentially the same thing as a hundred times better improvement. Um, and so that's really awesome. We just in, um, increase our coupling factor or decrease our coupling factor by a whole bunch. So like essentially the takeaway from this is like adding ground planes and pores really do help your signals from, from affecting each other. And, and the great thing is like, you know, this is like a really simple and really easy thing to do. That's why we kind of like um, emphasize it a lot while you were doing your layouts, because like all you got to do is just pour, you know, all the empty space in your, in your PCB with grounds, you know, put some via fencing and, and all that. Um, and it can really reduce like tremendously the amount of coupling that you get without having to do things like, you know, increasing the trace widths or their distance from one another and whatnot. So um, overall, a really cool thing. Um, but I'll pause. Are there any questions on this? Any thoughts about coupling? Valentine's Day is coming up soon, so you'll start to have to think about your coupling factor. So um, that's not the only, only uh, thing. I, I think there's one more thing I want to cover in terms of um, high frequency design, and that's the uh, uh, microstrip bends, which kind of represent um, discontinuities within our um, our circuits. And so this is essentially just literally like a right turn. You know, like when we route traces, we can't keep them going in a straight line all the time. Sometimes we have to turn them, and so. Um, you know, when you may think like if I'm going to tr turn a trace, like obviously I'll just do like a 90 degree turn. Um, but what, can actually, what that can actually do is introduce, um, well, the trace itself is a sh really sharp discontinuity. You know, you're going from one trace and then it's 90 degrees. And so that can result in impedance mismatches um, because the trace itself is able, or the bend itself is able to resonate uh, at its own impedance. And so... Um, as we kind of discussed before, now we have a like impedance mismatch within our uh, trace. So like this trace, you know, is some impedance which matches this end of the trace, but right over here, it's some different impedance. So when we have a signal going through here, it's going to reflect back, it's going to get degraded, um, even as it travels through this whole thing. So that's generally not good. We're going to get more signal degradations and all of that. And um, we can, of course, simulate this out. So. Um, you'll notice that, you know, as I put in electric field through here, um, we get an uneven field distribution throughout the trace. Um, there are some other like weird effects you could see right at the trace or right at the curve, but it's kind of hard to see. And then you can see that if I plot out the radiation fields from this, so this is a near field radiation, just like the electric and magnetic fields um, that are emitted like really close to the, to the trace itself, you'll see that like, we get these really, really spiky um, radiation fields over here. Same thing like with over here and here. And um, I don't have the scale shown, but like these are like at a really large magnitude. So what we essentially created is an unintentional like antenna within our, um, within our PCB design. Now, all the traces are all gonna act like antennas. That's just inherent. But this one's like a really powerful one. 
So if we have this, you know, turn over here, and I said it had like a chip over here, I'd be really like interfering with it because like I'm spewing all these like you know radio waves into like what's over over here, which is really not a good thing. And all the power that we radiate out is power that's not flowing through the trays, not flowing between our devices. So this is really not a good thing. Um, and so how do we fix this, of course? Well, we can simply just avoid sharp discontinuities. Um, and we can do that just by smooth by bent. So you see right here, I just, you know, filleted this corner. Um, so now it's just like a really smooth bend and I made it really wide too. Um, and so you'll see that as we simulate it out, we get this really even field distribution within it. We don't get weird effects at the edge over here. And um, looking at the fields as well, you'll see that, you know, now the fields are more rounded. Um, I don't have the scale shown, but the magnitude of the, the radiated fields coming out of here is much less. And then also, if you look at the plots, you know, in terms of the signal degradation that we're getting, um, you'll notice that this one degrades the signal a lot less. So we get less attenuation um, putting our signals through this bend. And so um, ultimately, it helps us out, reduces the amount of radiation, and keeps our signals looking good. And so um, that's kind of all I want to cover within, within that realm. And so the key takeaways is, you know, as signals increase in their frequency, their wavelengths decrease. And as those wavelengths get closer to the length of our traces and our um, devices, so, you know, like we're talking like fractional, like when we get to like a quarter of the, if the wavelength becomes like four times like the size of like our devices, that's when weird stuff can start to happen. Um, we also noted how impedance mismatches between traces or caused by discontinuities and all of that can result in all sorts of effects on our signals, which are not good, which degrade them out. Um, we noted how we can use, you know, PCB structures, certain PCB structures and stru structures. In this case, we, we focus mainly on the microstrip um, in order to create like impedance matches and um, ensure that we don't have any impedance con discontinuities within our uh, PCB design. Um, close parallel traces are going to be able to couple to each other, so we can use ground pores, separate them out, VFNs to reduce that, and um, sharp trace turns can cause impedance mismatches, so use smooth bends. Um, so yeah, any, any questions on any of those things? Awesome. And so uh, we're just going to look at some quick examples um, of, you know, this, this, these designs in practice. And the first one I want to do is, this is a revisit of one of the examples from lecture three. And so you'll notice in here, these guys use um, what are called, uh, they're called coplanar waveguides. They're like microstrips, except there's a ground plane, ground pore on the top <laughs> layer as well where the microstrip is. So it's, it's a similar kind of thing. And the reason they do that is it allows for better impedance matches, but they also, it also reduces coupling, of course, since now we have a ground plane on the top layer as well next to all these microstrips. And you'll notice that in the board design, they keep all the traces you know, nice and straight. They don't do any bends like that. Um, there are other techniques they use, like they remove the cyber mask on the top in order to allow them to better um, impedance match things because solder mask is a dielectric and you have to keep that into account as you do all sorts of impedance matching. Um, so yeah, this is like an example, and this the thing goes like you know, 28 gigahertz, so they really have to take that into account. So they use special connectors, special devices. Everything here is all 50 ohms, um, so yeah. And then here's another example. This is a 24 gigahertz radar, um, and you'll notice here that they, you know, they have to take you know, the signal from this chip to this chip, but they couldn't take a straight path, so they had to curve the uh, transmission line, but you'll see that um, in doing so, they kept it as nice curves. They didn't do sharp 90 degree bends because, of course, that's going to reduce our, um, our signal's integrity and um, cause all sorts of weird effects. This one also uses a coplanar um, waveguide type of um, structure, so essentially like a microstrip. And um, they, of course, also like around here where this is like a really high frequency signal, they have like a keep out zone, so keep other like devices away so they don't interfere. And um, fun fact, this one also has a phase array on the back, which you guys are not expert in. So. Um, but yeah, with that, we're going to take a look at um, like a demo. Let's look at, you know, doing this stuff in real life. I think I'll switch it, and then when you want to talk on it. I have this wire here, 
which is on the function gen. So it's generating the sine wave that we see. I think this is at like 10 megahertz or something in the sine wave. And it's coming out of the scope and we're also measuring it. So you can see it on the green one. And then on the yellow one is this trace here. Um, this is just a piece of wire. And so if I bring this closer, you can see there's more coupling. And so it shows up on the green, also shows up on the yellow. And of course, the yellow is literally just a piece of wire that is held close to the trace that is transmitting. You can see there's a lot of coupling right there when I hold these really close. If I separate them out just a little bit, there's a lot less coupling. And what I can do, <clears throat> I can turn this 90 degrees as well. And you can see there's very little coupling. But then when I turn it to be parallel, there's a lot of coupling. So if you really need to have two traces that need to cross over, make them cross over perpendicularly and not parallel, and you'll have less coupling. Yeah, the more like 90 degrees it is, the better. <laughs> and then the second thing, we were talking about stack up heights. So if you have data plus, data minus on your top layer, what you have for your USB, you might have a ground on the bottom here. So all your boards are two layers. There's like about 1.5 millimeters of distance here. And what that means is that for the 90 ohms impedance, you need this to be six mil. And then this is one millimeter or so. So this is really wide. So what we can do instead is if we decrease the distance between the, um, the differential pair and the ground pore beneath it. So if we had a four layer stack up, In a four layer stack up, this might be 0 0.5 millimeters or something. And so we can keep the same distance between the two. But then these can be much um, narrower. So you don't need the, you don't need the one millimeter spacing, like one millimeter trace width here. You can have it be much smaller if you decrease the distance between the trace and the ground pore underneath. And a lot of times that's one reason why you might use a four layer for impedance matching is because you don't need these stupidly wide traces to get say 90 ohms. That's right. And uh, that also applies in terms of the material selection that you choose. So like um, it's not only the substrate height which you can kind of configure sometimes, but you can also change the material. So that's changing the dielectric constant that I noted before. Um, so like for a lot of RF and microwave applications, we sometimes want a really low dielectric constant because it makes um, impedance matching like you saw there easier. Um, so like you can buy those, you can buy ones with greater ones. Uh, they usually increase the cost of the PCB. So like you guys are like making $5 PCBs. My PCBs are usually like $1,500 because of the special materials, but yeah. Um, those are usually considerations that we have to make. Um, and those are things that we have to do like right at the start. So that's why it's always like, we got to look into our layer stack manager. We have to create the stack up. So that way we can see what kind of like impedance matching do we have to do? What are the design characteristics of our traces? Um, and so we can do that and um, do uh, good impedancing matching. And so uh, I guess in the last few minutes, I just want to show Kind of a further visualization of what we we're talking about here. I'll see what you get on my screen. Um, so this is our um, like. I think you guys probably understand this pretty well, but this is what our, our you know microstrip looks like. And so you know we, this is like a three D view of it. This is what it looks like. So we have this trace on the top right here. 
Um, on the bottom, you see we have that ground pour, ground plane, and then like these ports that I were talking about, they look like these. So, oops. Expectations. So like we have a port right here, port on the other ends, and then like, you know, we can simulate this out and like we can show like what the fields look like. Oh, dang, I didn't simulate it. We'll simulate it for the microchip bed because I did simulate that. Yeah, and so you can see like the E fields that kind of flow. What? Never mind. No simulations are gonna happen. Um, but we can, you know, doing that we were able to see um, how things are affected. And so when you do like really high frequency stuff, um, you know, as as this guy once said, he built like some bomb or something. You know, theory is only gonna take you so far. So you can stick it in the simulator and. Um, and see how it how it works out. Um, so when you do like any, if you, any of you decide to go into RF and microwave, you'll be doing a lot of this, simulating it out um, to see. And uh, if any of you are interested in like playing around with this, I can um, package these files and so you can play around with them. Uh, but yeah, this is, you know, it's interesting stuff. That's the E fields in the air. Those are the E fields inside the microstrip itself. And then we can also even plot the magnetic fields. Those are the magnetic fields that you see. Um, this is like the magnetic potential, technically. So you'll see, like, oh, I guess it's kind of hard to visualize. But you know, like, we get like the, the right hand rule of magnetic fields going around. But yeah. Um, with that being said, there's a slide that says announcements on it. Oh, we look at this one. Announcements. Um, that's it for today's lecture. Um, your guys' boards have come in for most of you guys, like they, all your parts are here. So um, Winnie and I will have office hours all the way until like 5 p.m. today. So um, if any of you guys are, are free after lecture or sometimes between now and 5, and you like to get started on your board, um, you can come into the lab starting, you know, in two minutes. And uh, you can start building out your board, you know, get a head start. Um, this week, all the labs are going to be dedicated towards you guys fi fixing up or finishing your board, like your, your actual board, not your jungle board. And so, um, yeah, um, come in today if you want to. There'll be office hours all week. Friday um, is showcase day. Look at the schedule. But yeah, if there's no questions, I will see you guys at lab or office hours. We'll have office hours every day till five. Sweet. Let's stop. It's